this is Jesus. Uh, and the springboard, you're probably tired of me saying it, but, but I, I think it's good. If nothing else, these six weeks, hopefully we'll take that home. Uh, the, 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 the springboard here is, is, is kind of uh, twofold, right? The first one is that throughout the Gospels, and especially in the Gospel of John, uh, uh, Jesus calls people to this, to this thing called faith this, faith, this living relationship of trust with him. Faith is never simply an object that God happens to see inside of us. Uh, and, and, and he says, okay, I like him now. He's got faith. That, that's not what faith is. Faith is this relationship of trust with Jesus Christ. Throughout the Gospels, especially in John, Jesus calls people to this relationship of trust. That's what we were created for, all right? That's what sin breaks apart, so we're, we're isolated from God, and because we, we hurt each other, then we're isolated from each other, and what God does in Jesus Christ, he puts us back together, and, Jesus, and, and how he does that, he says, trust me and walk with me again in this relationship, and then that, that will color the relationship with other folks as we live in love, right? And so Jesus, throughout the Gospel of John, calls people to this relationship of trust with him, this thing called faith, all right? Uh, but he never seems to do it when there's not questions and mysteries that people have to work through. Uh, read, read through John if you get the chance this week. I mean, you start with old Nick, right? And he says, well, how can a man be born again, right? And, 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 and throughout the, the, the Gospel of John, people, the crowds are saying, well, wait a minute, we thought the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem, and this guy came from Nazareth, right? And, and you and I who have read the book of Luke, we, say, we want to step into it and say, hey, wait a minute, he was, he came. But, but Jesus never says to him, well, I was born in Bethlehem. He lets the questions stand, the mystery stand, right? In the midst of his call to faith. Can you relate to that? Do, do you have your questions? And, and, and your mysteries, are the things that are unexplainable for you, uh, the, the things that you quite, can't quite grasp, and, and through that, the voice of Jesus, his spirit touching your heart, says, just trust me. Just, just trust me on this. I love you, you're mine. Huh? Do, you, do you have that in your life? And throughout the, the gospel, especially John, in fact, John talks about these great signs and wonders that Jesus does. So that people will know that he is who he says he is and his words are true. And the greatest one, of course, is what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So at the end of the book of John, he says these are written so that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you might have life in his name, by believing in the midst of all your questions and all the mysteries, you see the empty tomb, huh? And you trust Jesus, who he is and what he does and what that means for you. You enter into this relationship of trust. That, that's our first springboard, and, and, and boy, if we can't connect to that, I think we got our eyes closed at what our life is all about, huh? The second one is that in these flashpoints of our lives every week that we've looked at, instead of looking at uh, one of the books like Romans, it's almost written like a textbook, uh, we look back at the Gospels because these are flesh and blood stories of how Jesus in his flesh and blood interacted and brought home these truths to people and to us, we live our lives in stories, and we can know and, and understand uh, much more greatly when we look at these stories than just a textbook laying it out, all right? And today, uh, the flashpoint is that Jesus directs our, our uh, lives uh, and, and our eternity is secure in him, okay? Uh, I don't know, um, whether, whether uh, uh, you've ever been to a place like this, up, up in Echo, at Echo Lake, uh, uh, there's, have, have you ever been to a hike at Echo Lake? It's up near uh, Tahoe. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? It's on Highway 49, is that right? Yeah, and I've, I've, been, I've been a few years, and you can go all the way around the lake, uh, and then uh, you come to this place where all of a sudden you have all the, it's like a cartoon almost. You have all these signs, you know, this way up here, up here, you can go. You got like a thousand decisions to make. You go to this, it's into the back country, you know, and, and, and you got all these different choices to make. And it matters which choice you make because you're gonna go where the sign says you're gonna go, right? It's like being on one of these crossroads in, in, in our lives, right? Which way are we going to go? It's, it, you remember the old poem, poem uh, Two Roads Diverge in Yellow Wood, a Robert Frost guy, right? Two Roads Diverge in Yellow Wood. And this guy, and, and it's just that simple. Guy walks up, he sees these roads, right? And he says, man, which way do I go? Which way do I go? And then at the end of it, he says, and the way I chose it made all the difference in my life. That's kind of scary, huh? Because we all come to these crossroads in our lives, and how do we know what's the best one? What should guide us, right? 
And, and, and this is what I want to take home today. Is there one who can guide our lives in the forks of the road? Who can, who can, amidst all the questions and mysteries, lead us in the path that makes all the difference? And the answer is yes. And his name is Jesus. And what we're going to look at today, we're going to see Jesus entering into the life of people and, and driving this point home. Okay? I don't know what crossroads you're at. I don't know what crossroads uh, you, you look back on and you shake your head and you, you feel like you fouled up. I, I don't know any of those things in your lives, but we all have those crossroads. Uh, we all have those places where we look back and shake our heads. Um, and, but, and we all have those places where we want guidance right now. Huh? Uh, that's what today is about, that Jesus is the one, all right, who is there for us in these forks in the road, okay? Uh, we start uh, with the transfiguration. Uh, this is the story we're going to look at. Um, and, and really, this is a, a story about a, a great fork in the road. This, the transfiguration takes place just a little while before Jesus would go the way of the cross. In fact, he's on his way to Jerusalem almost after this, right? And he'll go the way of the cross and the empty tomb. He'll ascend into heaven, and it will never be the same for the disciples ever again. They'd have to live like us. They're going to have to walk by, by uh, faith and not, not by sight. You have this great crossroads in their lives. It's going to be totally different. And how will they live? What will they do? See? So Jesus, in the moment that, that these disciples will experience, before the moment, he'll experience these great crossroads, right? He, he leads Peter, James, and John up, and, and, and he, um, he shines before them like the sun. And, and th that's kind of the setting of it all. Go ahead. He, he took Peter, James, and John, right? Now, why Peter, James, and John? Well, I know they were his, he, he, those three seem to be closest to him, but I also think they're a microcosm of every single one of us. Peter um, was a leader in the church, right? Uh, and and he, was, he was the rock, the, the, the leader of the church, and, and throughout his life, he'd be the leader of the church. And he also was a foul up, huh? Yeah, he, he also fell on his face a whole lot of times. Uh, do you remember? He said, Jesus, I, I want to walk in the water. Can, can I do it? Jesus said, come on. So he takes a step on the water. He looks the wrong way, and he starts to sink. Uh, Jesus says, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. All right, Peter, you got it, right? A few verses later, he's saying to Jesus, oh, no, you don't want to go the way of the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, I can relate to this guy. He's a screw-up, right? <laughs> Falls flat on his face. And then, on Monday, Thursday, right? <laughs> uh, all the disciples are going to uh, desert Jesus. He tells them that. And, Jesus, and Peter says, not me, man. Let them all go. I'm not going. And, 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 and Jesus says to Peter, he says, hey, look, pal, right? Before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And by the way, this fouling up, it didn't end with Jesus' ascension into heaven and the church starting, Right? There's a, in, in the book of Acts, Paul has to call Peter out because he's ignoring the Gentile Christians because he's more comfortable with the Jewish Christians. He's a respecter of persons, right? And Paul, it, it, Paul said, I had to call Peter out to his face, man. So Peter keeps fouling up. But he didn't disqualify himself. Can you relate to fouling up? You don't disqualify yourself. Then you got James. James, uh, most folks don't know this, he was the first disciple who was martyred for the faith. Legend has it that he was skinned alive by knives. Okay? Why would he be there? I mean, he wouldn't even last very long before he was dead. Because we all go through these fiery trials in our lives. And, and yes, we'll all go through death somehow. Huh? There is a um, picture in the book of, of Revelation, last book in the Bible, and the saints, those people who have been declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ, they're now in heaven and they're standing on this ocean, but they're not sinking. It's called a sea of glass, an ocean of glass, and, and they're not sinking. Uh, because, and, and they can look through it, and, and it's like they're seeing their lives, and there's these little wisps of, of fire and most commentators say these are those harsh times in their lives. The lightning bolts and the bang when, when things come up and they're suffering. And they can see in heaven, it seems like they drown in them this side of eternity, but in heaven they can see that God was there. James is there because the, he, he is representing every 
harsh and horrible trial in our lives. Uh, all the hard stuff we've got to go through. Can you relate to James? And John is there. Um, John lived to be an old man. He's the only disciple that we, as far as we know, that didn't die for the faith, right? So, so John had this long obedience in the same direction. Now, now just, I, I want to ask you a question. What do you think is easier? To stand up and die for Jesus right now? Uh, or to live for him for the next 40 years? I don't know about you, but the second one's harder for me, right? I can die for Jesus right now, woohoo! But if I gotta live 40 more years for Jesus, that's a lot harder, huh? Are you experiencing that sometimes? You see, Peter, James, and John, they're a microcosm, all of us. Can you find yourself there? This is setting up this reality of Jesus for us. And in the midst of all of this, in the midst of Peter the screw up, of James the guy that was gonna die, and John the one that has to have this long obedience in one direction, right? Jesus shows himself to be the, very, the only begotten son of God, the king of kings and, glo- and lord of lords. He shines in all of his glory and they have, they have to cover their eyes, he's so bright. So what are you saying? He's saying, in the midst of all of their weakness, in the midst of their fallops, in the midst of this long obedience that they can't do on their own, Jesus Christ is there for them as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He does not turn their back, his back on them. This is the setup. Us and Jesus, and Jesus in all of his glory. So what's going to happen here? The next thing we're told is this, that Jesus, uh, that just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, whenever I read this uh, out of this gospel, the first thing in my mind, I don't know if it's in your mind, but I'll I'll read this again. Tell me what's in your mind. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. What's the most natural question at this point? What are they talking about? Huh? Did did you work that way too? What what are they talking about? Well, if you go to a, this uh, story was recorded three times in the gospels. So if you go to a parallel account, it tells us what they were talking about. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. They were talking about the cross, his suffering, his victory, his resurrection. And I think, because if you look, uh, uh, Elijah and Moses, they, they kind of symbolize all the Old Testament scriptures. And in there, the, second, the first and second coming of Jesus is kind of accordion together in the prophecies. I think they're talking about his second coming and all of his glory. And I think the disciples are hearing that, right? That's why he's going up to Jerusalem. That's what, that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna be the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He's going to win in our place. He's gonna do it. This is the foundation of where we stand in the forks of the road. We stand here, go ahead. We stand here in that Jesus first and foremost secures our eternity. Our standing before God is not about the hoops we jump through. It's not about always choosing the right path. We really want to do that, right? But that's not what determines our standing before God. It is in the glory of the only begotten Son of God, he goes the way of the cross. It's called grace, God's undeserved love for us. Peter didn't disqualify himself. Even when he did the rooster thing, he didn't disqualify himself. Because it's about grace, see? And sometimes when we in this forks in the road, we, we get so corkscrewed up that somehow we have to choose right or God's not gonna like us, you know? That's just not right. Our eternity is settled. It is finished. Oh, and, and you know those poor choices we made? When we pulled the Peter back here, right? It's washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ is taken care of, and you have a brand new beginning, a resurrection right now, see? That's how it works here. When, you, um, when I went to seminary, I had a good friend, his name was Lee Genter, and when you go to the seminary, everybody seems to have a story of how they got there, 
Uh, because, because, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a deal where, where uh, you sell all you have and, and, and you leave your job or you leave wherever you're at and, and you're, you're taking this big step. So everybody, my, my, my story is that I, I, I was the Jonah guy. I ran the other direction and God said, no, this is where you're going, right? So that, that's just my story. And, and, but, but, but Lee was telling me how he was in this place of being all corkscrewed up, trying to make the right decision so that God would like him, right? And his pastor sat him down and he said, Lee, God's will for you is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You get it? God's grace doesn't depend on you making a right decision. You're in this state of grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Where do you need to do that in your life? and rest in his grace. That's where it begins, and, and we never leave this place. He secures our eternity. If we can relate to Peter, if we can relate to James and the, the, the hardships and, and catastrophes and even death of our lives, or if we can relate to John in this trying to, to live this long road of obedience for 40 years, you know? Our eternity doesn't depend on that. God looks down and smiles on us for Jesus' sake. Go ahead. So then Peter, he, he wants to make a response here. And, 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 and I think that, that you have to know that, that Peter is drawing on his experience and on his learning as a good Jewish boy, right? He says here uh, to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. The word here in the Greek is tabernacles. It's taken from the Hebrew. Uh, 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 three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, if, if, if you think about that, a good Jewish boy would say, okay, in the, in, in, in the beginning of my people, when God dwelled in a special way with his people in the 40-year in the wandering in the desert, we had this thing called a tabernacle. It was a, t- a temple that was portable. It was a big temple. It was a temple. It was ornate. Okay, that's how, and, and God is here in a special way. I know, I got it, and I want to be here, by the way. I like it here. I like the feel. I like that I feel protected. I don't have to worry about anybody else. It's all about me. So we'll just make three tents here, and we'll stay here, Jesus. How's that? You see, he was, he was immediately going to what he thought, what, what, what he wanted, uh, his wisdom, his experience, and he was all wrong. Can you relate to that? Even though he's well-meaning, he was all wrong. A voice from heaven said this. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the crowd said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to, uh, read the last three words with me. One, two, three. Listen to him. Peter, you got it all wrong. It, it, don't, don't go to what you think right away. Don't go to your experience right away. Don't go to what you've learned right away. Listen to the words of my son. Just listen, that's where you go first. You can use this other stuff, but that's where you go first, Peter. Jesus directs our path. We're in this state of grace, and yet in his love, he would direct our way. He doesn't leave us alone. So the great question here is this one. (laughs) Great picture, by the way. (laughs) How do we listen to him? Most of us don't hear a lightning bolt out of the clouds. Most of us don't hear voices. Now, I'm not poo-pooing that. God can do what he wants to do, right? But for most of us, that's not how we hear Jesus. And that's, that's not where we hear him in the same way where we can relate to each other, right? How do we listen to him? Years later, Peter was writing about this, uh, this event in his life, all right? He, he was writing about this adventure with Jesus up on the mountain. It's in the book of Second Peter. It's in the Bible. The Spirit of God was given the words, but he also had the experience, right? And this is what he was writing. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his glory. I used that, didn't I? That word glory, where did I get that? Jesus revealed his glory right here. 
We were eyewitnesses of his glory. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So he's talking about Transfiguration Day, right? He's, he's talking about how we were there, we heard him, and, and, and the very next day out of his mouth he would say, hey, uh, uh, we heard the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And you're expecting him to say, okay, the next, he's also going to say, that voice said, listen to him, and he never says it. He never writes it down in Peter. Why? Well, let's see. Go ahead. He ties it rather to the words of the prophets. He tells us what the father was pointing to when he said, listen to him. He was pointing to the words written by the spirit in the Old Testament and new. He said this, we have the words of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it in the crossroads of your life as a light shining in a dark place. See, God speaks to us, to all of us in that place. And not only the Old Testament, Go ahead. In the New Testament, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, the writings, right, came about by the prophet's own interpretation. But, but, but people of God, led by the Spirit, wrote these down, right? This is where Jesus speaks to us, through these words. And, and, and this isn't just something where we, we stumbled onto as New Testament Christians. It was always that way. It, back in the Psalms it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my, read the last word, path. I mean, even in the forks of the road, especially in the forks of the road, huh? This is where God speaks to us. Jesus says this, he says, whoever hears these words, read the rest of it with me, and puts them into practice, builds his life on the rock. That's what he said. His words written down in the New Testament, right? His words, he speaks to us. And these words, um, you know, we, we have to be careful. We, we look at these words on paper, and, and, and we think they're lifeless, dull, and dead. But the Bible calls these words the sword of the Spirit. They never come naked and bare to us. But as we, as we read these words, as we proclaim these words, as we talk about these words, as we share these words, the very Spirit of God there, the Ruach of God, brings them to our hearts and touches us and would guide us. In all these words, they're living words, see? The Spirit of God works through them, even as we're talking about this. They're not dead and dull and lifeless. They're alive, and they're meant to connect with us in our lives, especially when our lives have to make, we have to make a decision here in the forks of the road. Well, and what do those words say? How, where, where do we start? Jesus, in the New Testament, or rather in, in the New Testament, the epistles, Paul wrote, that we've been given these gifts, all of us have been given great and wondrous gifts to be used in service. It's not about us. You see, Peter went right to himself, what I think, what I want, what would make me comfortable, what I want to achieve. And we go the wrong way then. Jesus says, I've gifted every single one of you. I shower down gifts upon you so that you can serve one another. And when you lose your life, you find it. Come follow me. Lose your life so that you can find it. I remember um, in, in uh, college, I think I was a junior, senior when I met her. Her name was Loli. Uh, she was a really neat gal, and she was brilliant. She was in pre-med. Uh, and, and you would, and in talking with her, you'd think that she had her life uh, planned out to, to be successful and a grand and glorious doctor because she was brilliant. I remember going through a, a change of amino acids with her. Oh my gosh, uh, she, she was awesome. You, you know what her dream was? She wanted to go down to South America and open a free clinic. That's why she was doing all her studying. I was reminded of her this last couple weeks. There's a guy named uh, Ryan, and uh, he's been working with us, and he's applying uh, for, for med schools. He's, he's actually uh, had a couple of interviews, and we're, I'm praying for him. And, and it, when you talk to him, you find that, that one of the things that's driving him wanting to be a doctor is some things that he's gone through in his life and where he can plug in and thinks he can help people. You, you see, the Spirit of God and his word would would empower us to make that the center place, the beginning place of the steps we take on these forks in the road. We, we each of us is, is on mission with Jesus. Everyone who believes in him, we're, we, we, we are on mission with Jesus in every calling of our lives. Certainly together we all are, are witnesses. We're all called to, to love our neighbor, right? Whatever, wherever our neighbor is and whatever that looks like, man, that's the beginning of, of this decision, the forks of the road. 
but, but, but also in the individual callings of our lives. Uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Whew. So that every decision you make in your relationship with your wife and children is built on that. That you're a servant. When you lose your life, you find it. That you're a servant to your wife and to your children. I mean, to me, this is one of those things, too, by the way, where, you know, if I could just stand up and die for my kids, it'd be a lot easier, than like, but I gotta live for them, right? But Jesus is always there with his spirit to guide me and to help me, see? A, a wives, a, a love and honor your, your, your husbands. What if, what if every decision in the crossroads of life with respect to that relationship started there? Children, uh, honor your father and mother. Moms and dads, raise up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What if every decision we made as parents started in that place? Do you think we'd be more wise in the lives we lived? You see, the spirit of God through his word is, is active and vibrant and powerful. And by the way, if you're sitting there banging yourself up the head, like running yourselves over the coals, like, oh man, I should have known, oh man, that's right, that's right. You're just pulling a Peter, man, right? It's done, it's taken care of. You're washed clean in the blood of Christ. Peter did not disqualify himself. He had a brand new beginning every single day. That's what the resurrection's all about. John, uh, uh, Paul said, I forget the past. Why? It's washed clean in the blood of Christ. And I go to the future. I take the next step in the future. As what? As a beloved child of God. With my eternity certain and sure. My standing before God in grace certain and sure. And yet also guided by his word and spirit in these forks in the road. The book of Philippians it kind of pulls this all together for me. It says, and finally, brothers and sisters, whatever, and, and the word is anthropos, so it is brothers and sisters. I don't know why they just say brothers. But anyway, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, how do you know what this is? Because the words of Jesus in his book guide you as to what these things are, right? If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Do it, right? He directs your path. Oh, and, and those places you're gonna get all cork screwed up, right? Oh man, is it, is, does it depend on me? No. You're standing before God doesn't depend on you. It's all about Jesus. And, and it's the place where we begin. The God of peace will be with you. This shalom peace of body, soul, mind, and spirit. This peace that comes from Jesus alone. His grace, his blood that covers you, right? He secures your eternity so that you can listen to his voice, to his word, to guide you. Brand new every day in his grace. A thousand years before Jesus some would say the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, as the God's spirit guided him, wrote these words. If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, then you will understand what is right and just and fair. Read the next three words with me. Every good path. I guess people have always had these crossroads, right? They, 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 they've always had these forks in the road. Every good path, right? For wisdom, and, and the Bible calls finally Jesus Christ the wisdom of God. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. He secures your eternity. He directs your path. Take that home with you. See how God guides you this week. So this week, uh, where are the places right now where you are at a crossroad in your life? Where do you need to be reminded in the midst of this that Jesus is the one who secures your identity and it stands done? By grace through faith, do it. And at these crossroads, where are you trying to figure it out alone in your own wisdom, wants, and needs? Where do you need to hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. By grace through faith, do it. For Jesus is also the one who directs your path. As Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, builds his house on the rock. Uh, may that be you as you know your certainty before God in Jesus Christ, and as his child, listen for his voice, his word, as he guides your path. 
Amen. If you receive the offering uh, today, if you've not yet filled out one of the connection cards, they're in the chairs ahead of you. Uh, and um, we're kind of gathering folks that have just an interest in maybe becoming members of the church. So if that, in the next month or so, if that's you, uh, go ahead and check that on the card as well, and, and we'll certainly connect with you.